Hey, welcome back, I'm Lei. Let me first of all clear the air. This is not a fan video of SpaceX or Rocket Lab. I want to dive deeper into the details of building a rocket company, focusing on three factors, engineering, resources, as well as business, and try to explain to you some of the hardships entrepreneurs have to go through in order to build a rocket company. So why is it so hard to build a rocket company? What about the difficulties Elon Musk had to go through in the process of building SpaceX? If you're curious about that, stay with me and let's talk about it today. And thanks to Brilliant.org for supporting this episode. More about it later. Engineering is at the very foundation of a rocket company. There needs to be a rocket for the company to exist. Simple as that. So how to build a rocket? Roughly, a rocket encompasses four major systems. The structural system, the payload system, the guidance system, and the propulsion system. The structural system includes the fairings, the body of the rocket and for selected rockets, fins for more stability and perhaps landing. The payload system is where the cargoes or the astronauts are, and the guidance system includes telemetry, sensors, and other instruments. And lastly, the propulsion system consists of engines, turbo pumps, and fuel tanks. When we're talking about building a rocket, all systems matter, but for different purposes, different systems might be more important. For example, the propulsion system usually dictates how powerful a rocket is. But for manned spaceflight, more emphasis is put on the payload system. If we're talking about a ballistic missile, the accuracy of the guidance system matters more. And lastly, for companies like SpaceX, which succeeds on the reusability of its rocket, the structural system is of the greatest importance. Re-entering the Earth's atmosphere from hypersonic speed can easily burn up any less robust structure. So as you can see, every system plays a role and collectively makes the rocket powerful. For a construction company, it cares about the stability of the structure, for an internet company, it spends most of its money on software and web engineers, but for a rocket company like SpaceX, it must be good at everything. Computer engineers and electrical engineers for the guidance system, material engineers for the structural system, chemical engineers and mechanical and aerospace engineers for the payload and the propulsion system. Not only do rocket companies need all types of engineers, they must also be the best engineers in their respective field. This is a very hard task. At the end of the day, the work SpaceX does is like a truck company, transporting payloads from one location to another. But here's why SpaceX get paid $60 million per trip. During a short period of 20 minutes, Falcon 9 must achieve over 25 times the speed of sound, pass through temperatures above 3000 degrees Celsius, enduring wind speed over 50 kilometers per hour while having a controlled explosion inside its nine Merlin engines. Rocket engineering is the pinnacle of human achievement, the combination of all that we know about our universe. This is, I think, one of the biggest entry barriers of the space industry and why despite thousands and thousands of startups founded every year, most of them are internet companies. Seldom do you see them making rockets. It's just harder to build rockets. This is now a great segue for me to transition to the second aspect of a rocket company that makes or breaks it. It's resources. Both human resources and economic resources. If you think about it from a macro standpoint, this factor alone will limit a rocket company to be either employed by a national agency with great resources or at least companies based in the United States, China, Russia, India, Japan, and perhaps France, where Ariane rockets are being made. For other places on the planet, the entry barriers will be higher simply because there aren't enough high caliber engineers available. This high caliber is in quotation because it's not simply about ability. There are great engineers everywhere, including Singapore where I live, but information regarding building rockets are highly controlled due to its dangerous military application, intercontinental ballistic missiles. For smaller countries like Singapore, it's virtually impossible to acquire related knowledge regarding building rockets. So if you don't have anyone who knows how to build a rocket or you don't have enough to pay them, you don't have a company. Now, let's assume your company is based in one of those countries and you have found people coming out of NASA, Boeing or SpaceX to work for you. You will still need a lot of financial capital to make things work. Elon with $100 million only had enough to test four rockets. That's $25 million per test. Can you imagine that? 
For internet startups, they can literally start doing tests with just a simple website. This is the second reason why it's so hard to start a rocket company. Startups need rapid trial and error to test their products, but failures are too expensive in the space industry. The third factor I want to talk about is business. This aspect is not as straightforward as the first two, but just as important, if not more. I want to first of all bring out an investment concept called payback period. Investors like to diversify their investment by investing in projects of different risk levels. They're investing in stocks, in currency, in commodities, in real estate, and also in startup companies. Each has a different risk level. Each has a different period of investment. Among startups, there are people working on internet companies like Facebook. There are also people working on rocket companies like SpaceX. Both are high risk, high return investment, but the payback period is vastly different. I've not seen a rocket company manufacture a working rocket under five years, but internet companies like Facebook and Uber, they're already dominating the world in five years. That's why it's so hard to get money for rocket companies. Investors prefer internet companies because the payback period is much shorter. And honestly speaking, when SpaceX started in 2002, the risk of investing in a space company is much higher. It's never been done before at the time. Even Elon Musk did not believe that SpaceX could succeed at the time. This is the reason why I love space startups, because they are true enthusiasts of technology, working on a project for over 10 years that has little prospects of return. That's respectable. Another difficulty under this factor is the unique market conditions. Space industry, contrary to popular belief, has a tiny market. There are only a few possible customers. The government for military launches, commercial satellite companies, as well as research institutions like universities. Every year, less than 100 launchers are performed and they were dominated by government-affiliated launch providers like the United Launch Alliances and Ariane before SpaceX disrupted them. But even if all launches are performed by SpaceX, it's only a $6 billion business. It's a tiny market comparing to other businesses. The auto industry is a $2 trillion business, for example. Facebook made $15 billion net income in 2017. So the launch provider industry is a tiny industry and now with SpaceX, there is no more vacancy for newcomers. But here you might want to ask me, what about Rocket Lab then? My answer is, Rocket Lab's situation is very unique. It's exploring a new market that has not existed before, focusing on tiny cube satellites that usually have a hard time piggybacking on huge rockets. Now with Rocket Lab's Electron Rocket, Researchers around the world can launch their cube satellites on a dedicated rocket at as low as $80,000 per launch. That is, in my opinion, a great news for scientists, engineers, and researchers around the world. So as far as Rocket Lab's business is concerned, we will have to wait and see how the small and medium satellite market emerges in the coming years. The good news is, their rockets are already booked until 2023. In the end, it's not hard to see that the space industry is easily the hardest industry in the world. It's not for the faint of heart. In addition to building the hardest machine in the world, you need to be resourceful like Elon Musk. Be patient and are willing to grind it out over 10 years and even with all that, you still need a little bit of luck and timing to make it work. For example, if SpaceX is not based in the United States and did not get the funding and down payments from NASA, SpaceX might have died a long time ago. So putting all the ingredients together, starting a rocket company is easily the hardest venture in the world. So if you're looking to start something yourself and make a living with it, look somewhere else. However, if you have that spark of engineering and entrepreneurship inside of you and you want to solve the hardest problems in the world, this is it. But before you do so, you need to prepare yourself for that. Therefore, I recommend Brilliant.org to you. The story of SpaceX is a story of taking on bigger and bigger engineering challenges. Falcon 1, Falcon I, Falcon Heavy, and the latest Big Falcon rocket. In a similar way, Brilliant helps you enhance your understanding of rocketry with more and more challenging problems. Through solving interesting problems and examples in a structured way, Brilliant helps you link different physics and mathematics topics together. For audiences, my recommendation is to start with the courses in Science Essentials and Classical Mechanics and slowly move on to more challenging courses like Gravitational Physics and maybe even Special Relativity. To support Curious Elephant and learn more about Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash Curious Elephant and sign up for free. 
first 200 people click on the link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. It's a pretty good deal. Check it out if you're interested.